Hi everyone, welcome back to No Water River. Today is the last day of Poetry Month, 2012, and I am really thrilled to present the Children's Poet Laureate J. Patrick Lewis in a recorded interview. Pat, welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Renee. It's a delight, delight to be here. I, I'm, I'm just very excited. Yeah, well, that makes two of us. <laughs> so, we just saw your video, and I need to start with asking you the same question I ask everybody else. How long have you been a rhyming fool? <laughs> I came to it very late. I, I um, was a college professor of economics for 30 years before I discovered poetry at the age of about 39, and then I became a fool for it, and... Um, I, I just, the only thing I knew was that I loved it and I wanted to spend the rest of my life with it. Uh, so I stopped everything and I started reading poetry for, for about three or four years. And then when I thought I knew something about the craft, I, I started to write. And that was followed by, that was followed by years and years of rejection. But that's another story. In fact, we're going to get to that part of the story a little bit later because, okay. uh, of course, we're interested in rejection. <laughs> we're poets, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll talk about that in a little bit. As to the, the Poet Laureate, the Children's Poet Laureate, uh, do you have a, a mission during this time, something that you want to get across to, to kids, to teachers, to parents, to the nation? Uh, what is it that you, the Poetry Foundation expects you and wants you to do, and what do you want to do? Well, when they called me and told me that I was going to be the next Children's Poet Laureate, uh, the director of the Poetry Foundation said that my duties would be, in his words, light. And uh, by which he meant that I was to give two major uh, talks uh, in the two-year period of the laureateship. Mm -hmm. And I've already done that, one in Chicago at the Poetry Foundation, one at Poets House in New York City. Um, but if there's a mission involved, it was never mentioned. I see my mission as being a kind of Pied Piper uh, for poetry, and that's why I continue to make school visits. I'm, I'm leaving Monday for Russia, and I'm going to visit the same school, at the Anglo-American school, uh, at which my son was a kindergartner when he was five, uh, and uh, now he's 45, so 40 years later, I'm going back to the same school. Uh, it's it's kind of kind of miraculous to me, but uh, I'm excited to go. Now, Pat, you've written over 70 children's books, uh, most of them poetry, and I, I can't imagine they're all about bad-mannered insects. So, what are they about? And do you have any particular subjects that inspire you to to write about, or are they do they run the gamut? I think what inspires me is that there are so many subjects about which to write. Um, I've done books on Michelangelo, Galileo, famous women, famous black Americans, uh, famous monuments around the country, uh, the Civil War. Um, so whatever I haven't done yet, I, I guess I would have to say I would like to do. Um, and uh, right now, for example, I'm working on a collection with uh, a lovely author uh, by the name of George Ella Lyon. Mm -hmm. uh, she and I are trying to do a book on uh, the wash on uh, the Mar March on Washington, 1963, and uh, so I have high hopes for that. But uh, uh, and I can also mention we just got a book accepted. Ken Nesbitt and I just got a book accepted called uh, Mongolian Death Worm. Uh, it's about uh, cryptids, uh, you know, animals that. People speculate about, but they haven't really provided confirmation that they exist. So, hmm. so that should be fun. Well, that sounds yeah. like a fun one. So, you yeah. would say most of yours are actually collections centered around a particular subject, not rather than an anthology or a general yeah. a general collection of poems. Yes, that's true. However, if I may put in a plug, I mm -hmm. I have a, a general collection of poems uh, coming out in um, either late this year or early next year. Um, I think there are 156 poems um, in the sort of Silverstein Prolutsky format, um, which is to say general, a general collection rather than, than a thematic collection, uh, and that's going to be called um, hmm, 
if you were a chocolate mustache, uh, and uh, it's going to be published by Word Song, uh, Boys Mills Press. But at the same time, in September, I have I have my actual first uh, anthology coming out uh, with National Geographic. It's called uh, I it will be called the National Geographic the National Geographic uh, Book of Animal Poetry, and there will be 200 poems in that, not illustrated, of course, but with uh, National Geographic uh, photos. Besides, you know, running around and uh, running off to Moscow at the drop of a hat, what is your favorite part about being a children's poet? Well, I suppose the first thing is, there are several things. First, I get to write books for people I love, uh, my friends and my family. Um, secondly, I get to make school visits and hang around with teachers and students uh, for a day, which is always energizing, and I, I love doing that. But I suppose the biggest thrill for me is the fact that I can sit here in the chair that I'm sitting in now, and uh, when I'm not answering emails, um, I can play with words all day. And uh, what better job is that? And uh, I can't imagine that could be a better job than just juggling words and, and hope that some of them come out. To, uh, to have some, some lasting effect. I think some, some Donald Hall, the poet, said, um, uh, you should get up every day thinking that you are going to write great poetry. Will it happen? No, it won't. But when was that the point? The point is not, not to really write great poetry. The, the point is to strive to do so. And uh, because of that, I, I think... Yeah, that's all. And yeah, substitute music or art or dance or any other word mm -hmm. for poetry, and and that's what we should all be doing. So yeah, and I think that's a lovely lesson uh, uh, for both kids and adults, you know, who are trying to write poetry or do any sort of art. It's really a lovely sentiment, really. Right. And Donald Hall also said something I thought was interesting. He said the last third of one's life should be devoted to work. Which, of course, is counterintuitive. Uh, most people think that the last third of a person's life should be devoted to retirement. But, uh, mm -hmm. but writers never retire, so uh, I'm, I'm giving it my all. And I think we're very lucky in that respect. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Now, we talked a little bit about how you got started, and, the, and you mentioned briefly uh, some rejection. Because I had in my little brain that there you were, uh, being an economics uh, professor, and then boom, you're you're a published poet. Ah. So I was wondering, what, what was that? Can you tell us a little more about your path to publication, especially considering how difficult it is to get poetry published? I mean, I can't even imagine going now and saying, "Hi, I'm brand new in the market. Here's my book yeah. of poetry." I don't think well, it happens. I, yeah, I'll say one thing: it's mm -hmm. it's probably much more difficult these days, simply because so many people are trying. Mm -hmm. Um, but what happened was I, I visited a place in Cumberland Falls, Kentucky, and if you're there at just the right time of year, uh, it has to be a full moon, you will see something called a white rainbow. I don't know if I mentioned this, um, but uh, anyway, I saw that, and I was, I was just inspired to write this story. I sent it off to a publisher. Two weeks later, they accepted it, and I thought, wow, this is going to be easy. Um, two and a half years later, the publisher... Uh, reneged on the contract and it broke my heart but uh, it taught me a very good lesson and that is that this is not going to be easy so for the next seven years I got nothing nothing but rejections until in 1985 my first book was accepted but in, in that seven years I've been writing a lot of adult poetry which has been published in 70 or 80 journals and uh, uh, but you come to realize that writing adult poetry is like writing in sand. Um, it gets accepted at journals with two, three hundred uh, subscribers, and right. very few people read it. Uh, and getting a, a whole collection of adult poems published, uh, which I did finally in the year 2010, is just beastly difficult. Um, so, uh, you know, my hopes and for for anyone who's trying to do that uh, are are great. I mean, I, I I wish them well. So what you're saying is that uh, it didn't happen suddenly, obviously, 
and uh, you didn't quit your day job, let's say, and you had those seven years where you were trying to do both things. You were still being an right. economics professor and, yes. and submitting and submitting and submitting. Yes, actually yeah. 10 years. Um, I, I got my first book published, children's book, in 1988, mm -hmm. uh, and I got my first, um, well, and then I retired in 1998 uh, when I thought that perhaps the combination of writing and school visits would be sufficient to allow me to be a full-time writer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so far it's worked, so I'm happy. Now, as an economics uh, major in college, I imagine that you had to take a lot of poetry classes. So uh, <laughs> what is your training like? I mean, are you just a natural? I mean, now, where did that come from? Uh, you, you, <laughs> yeah, oh, my dear, you would imagine incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, took, <laughs> I took one poetry class, and uh, unfortunately, it was the same kind of class that I think many teachers have taken. Mm -hmm. um, it was all about analysis, and um, uh, to me, poems should never be analyzed. They should be read for pure entertainment, um, and if they're not entertaining, then you should be doing something else. So, so the short answer is that all of my uh, poetry quote, training was really self-taught. I, I fell in love with poetry at the age of 39. Uh, I realized that I knew nothing about it. And so I, I read for four years and poetry and books of poetry, books about poetry and prosody. And, um, so finally when I was, when I thought I, I knew something of the craft, then I just started, started to write, write poetry. And a lot of my first efforts were just execrable. Uh, <laughs> I sh should never see the light of day, and they haven't, fortunately. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned a, a soapbox, my personal little soapbox uh, subject, which is appreciation over analysis. Um, so I completely agree with you on that, and that's a big part of what No Water River is about and about bringing you poets and my own poetry, uh, when I have two seconds, um, and just having fun with it, with the videos, right. you know, just, right. I, I like to call it setting it free in the wild, setting a poem free in the wild, which is why I have most of you traipsing out in the woods. Um, because I really think way too much uh, time and effort is spent on ripping out the guts of a poem mm -hmm. instead of just letting it wash over the kid. I really love hearing the poet laureate backing me up on that because <laughs> uh, a lot of people wouldn't back me up on that. If I could just add one point to that, which yeah, I think please. actually goes along with what you're saying. Um, if you take the word fun out of funny, mm. um, you still have the word fun. Um, what I'm saying is yeah. poems don't have to be funny to be no. entertaining. Um, I, I, you know, when I sit down on the chair every day, I'm not necessarily trying to write funny poems. Uh, maybe half the time, maybe less. But I love to write serious poems. I love biographical poems. I love to pick out famous characters and write about their lives or famous events like the Civil War. Uh, and I think those kinds of poems can be equally entertaining. Uh, they don't have to be knee slappers. Serious poetry can be every bit as much fun as, as honey poetry. And, and uh, um, I mean, I understand, for example, Shel Silverstein um, I don't know that he wrote many serious poems. If he wrote any, Jack Kowalski the same way. And, uh, you know, wonderful. They should do what they want to do. Um, but I don't want to do that. I, I, you know, I'm trying to write, as I say, in a hundred voices uh, across the curriculum for all ages. And so I might be uh, tempted to write a, a simple uh, verse for a pre-K K group, or I might be able to, I, I might try to write something much more um, elevated for uh, for an older group, high school students, even even uh, adults. Um, so you know, let a hundred flowers bloom. You don't have to you don't have to constantly write about poetry, even though Shel Silverstein and Jack Kowalski are good examples of that. Um, you can write about just anything under the sun. To me, somebody comes up to me and says, "I saw a poem the other day, and I was sure it was yours." Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a compliment. I don't. I, I don't want people to know that a poem was written by me. If, if, if the poem is any good, you should be able to erase the poet's name. Poets biodegrade. Um, 
poems that they have any chance of living on might well do so uh, without the poet. Uh, so it's the word, it's the poem that's important, not the poet. Yeah, and Jack, I've been looking at uh, quite a few of your poems from different uh, areas, uh, different books, different uh, things I found online, adults, children, uh, even yeah. in the beautiful, gorgeous uh -huh. house that you were kind yeah. enough to send me, which the disparity is really, you know, even from the, the poem you shared today, Mosquito, which obviously is a humorous poem, right. To, right. To, reading, to reading the the very evocative verse that's in uh, the house, you know, it... It's obvious that you do speak in a million voices, and um, and that is something to strive toward, uh, for sure. But it is very interesting because you do see, you know, many po poets uh, have a very distinct voice. I'm not sure if I think that's all bad, but uh, you know, at the same time, obviously, it's wonderful to stretch. I mean, I think that's the poet's job is to stretch. One, one way to stretch, it seems to me, is to move away from um, common measure. Uh, mm -hmm. from valid verse, the simple um, four three line structure. Um, you know, I'm trying to write in foreign uh, foreign verse forms, mm -hmm. uh, uh, completely unexpected verse forms, and um, so. I, and I think all poets should do that. I mean, even even humorous poets uh, who are known as being humorous poets, I think they can stretch their muscles by moving away from. Uh, the the quatrain the tetra, uh, tetra, tetrameter quatrain or um, that that you know rhymes a b a b or um, a a b b I'm, I I just I just think those those get kind of tiresome uh, and especially when you read a whole collection of them at one time yeah uh, no there's no entertainment value there for me. Yeah, it's the, the you know the, the children's poet comfort zone for, perhaps. Sure it is. Sure, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's something to fall back on, and and uh, don't ever fall back on anything. You should be thrusting ahead. Right. Well, on these same lines, then, what would be your best advice for kids who want to write poetry? Well, first of all, I would say, as I always say in schools, don't rhyme. You put yourself in the box of rhymes, it's like putting on handcuffs. I remember when I was a child and, and I was drawing, and people would always say, uh, my parents, teachers would say, don't go outside of the lines. Um, but every illustrator in America would tell you the same thing. The first rule of illustration is go outside the lines. Break borders. And I would say to students who are writing, don't you know, don't put yourself in the box of rhymes. It's too difficult to write yourself out out of it. Mm -hmm. If they were willing to spend eight hours a day in a chair, um, that would be fine. But but they aren't. Right. They they write it once and they think it's over. A poem written once is never finished. You know, and, and it's not that's not news they want to hear. But I don't know why we should tell them otherwise. I don't know why we should tell them. Oh, wonderful poem after they've written one poem. And so if you're writing poetry, just write. Just write. Let it be prose lines. Let it be free verse. If at some point they want to become uh, poets, they can go back and learn metrics and uh, rhyme and all the rest of it. Right, but in the beginning, just let the, the words out, basically. Yes, yes. However they come out. A exactly. Well, but you give a child a, a word to rhyme, and he rhymes it in such a way that it doesn't even rise to the level of good nonsense. <laughs> I mean, Lewis Carroll and Edward Lear could write good nonsense, but children generally don't do that. Um, so, well, they don't have the the literary chops yet to do such a thing, right. obviously. And, and, so, and they shouldn't. And I, I don't think they should be encouraged to do that. Hmm. They should never be encouraged to rhyme. Hmm. Yeah. So we touched a little bit earlier on uh, how difficult it is to get poetry published. Um, what would be your advice then for adult children's poets who really do want to get their, their poetry published, other than don't bother? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I would tell them what they already know, which is that it is incredibly difficult. I'm, I'm so glad I started when I did rather than today. Um, 
it, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. The only the only advantage they have today is that they publish a book called Children's Writer and Illustrator Market. Comes out every year, yeah. and it tells you where the, what the markets are. So you should study that very carefully. But um, um, you know, I, boy, it's it's tough. You can't. They say you can't get an agent without getting published, and you can't get published without getting an agent. The ultimate catch twenty two. Well, obviously, you can get published without getting an agent, mm -hmm. but it's it's very very difficult. But you know, when when t writers come up to me, uh, would be writers, people who haven't published, and say, "Where can I get an agent?" My first answer is that agents are in the business of making money for themselves, mm -hmm. and they're not going to take on an unrecognized character or or, or a client. Um, you really do have to have something published. So. So I guess the answer is that you continue to send out and hope that you, you lightning strikes. You, what do you uh, mean by send out? To so magazines, anthologies, and to magazines? Are, that's pointless. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 600 magazines, journals, small journals for adults in America. Mm -hmm. There are maybe six journals for children that I would call quality journals. There are many that are just terrible. Um, it's a feast or famine world, adult versus children. Uh, but even if you get a poems, two or three poems published in Cricket or in Highlights or in some of the other magazines, um, that doesn't make a collection. And uh, so you, you have to just continue to hope that this uh, accretion of publications continues and you have some kind of track record to show uh, to show an agent. It helps, of course, if you know somebody. Um, but if you don't know somebody, you just have to go through the the routine of sending out to uh, unknown unknown publishers and hope you get a response. But but usually the response from publishers, or at least book manuscripts, is six to eight months long. Yeah. And uh, um, you can get very old very fast waiting for to hear from one publisher. So if, if they're open to it, it's useful to send out multiple submissions. But I have to say, uh, having published uh, the number of books I've published does not make me immune to rejection. I get rejected all the time. All the time. Yeah, last week I got rejected. I mean, I, I tell kids, when your teacher gives you back a, a poem or a story and she tells you maybe you should redo it, you don't get angry because you know the teacher's right, but you're allowed to get sad for five minutes. And that's the way I feel about a rejection. I get sad for five minutes, and I pick myself up, brush myself off, and keep on going. Uh, I might send it out to a couple of other publishers. I may not. It just depends on, uh, it just depends on you know, how strong I feel about the manuscript. Well, it's kind of comforting to know if the 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 U.S. Children's Poet Laureate is still getting rejections. All, all the time. There's hope, all, all, or there's all, not hope, one or the other. <laughs> I'm not sure which. <laughs> um, the last thing is, uh, I wondered if uh, you know, talking about what kids should read and everything else. Is there are there particular books of, of poetry um, that you would recommend for children, or particular poets uh, that you think they should read? Well, let, let's just suppose for a moment that I were a teacher uh, and I had a third grade class and my, my objective was to get them interested, more interested in poetry. Um, I would first of all uh, fill my class with as many books as possible. I always say, let a hundred flowers bloom. Not just the kind of poetry I like, but all kinds of poetry. Funny poetry, nature poetry, serious biography, all kinds of poetry. I would also break up the day with uh, drop everything and read sessions 10 minutes at a time. Uh, I would encourage more participation between them and uh, between them and the library. Take kids to the library. Set up a poet's corner in a library. There are so many interesting things that teachers can do. Uh, I tell principals when I make school visits, uh, what Billy Collins told high school uh, principals, I tell elementary school principals, you know, let volunteers read on morning announcements. 
uh, it would become a habit. They'd have people lining up to do it. They really would. I, I, I honestly believe that. You know, I, I don't have great expectations when I go into a school. I, I, in the back of my mind, I think if I can reach three or four students out of 400, then I will think, and I think my, my mission has been accomplished. Uh, you're not going to, you're not going to get very more than that. So, um, as far as what they should be reading, I know that you have a particular affinity for the classics. What, uh, as far well, as what I, kids should I, be only reading? Because, only because I, I wanted to, uh, um, I wanted to know as much about it as possible. Mm -hmm. I think too many poets these days start writing poetry without having read. And I'm not talking about going back to the Greek and Latin poets. If you do that, that's great. I'm talking about the 18th, 19th century, 20th century, even some 20th century poets in Britain and the United States. And right. Yeah. And also, you know, it's important for kids too. I mean, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot to be learned, obviously, from the classics for kids. You know, uh, Lear yeah. and, and uh, Carol. I mean, yeah. these are wonderful things that when we'll talk about appreciation, you know, yeah. uh, of the language and the and the and the excitement that a poem can bring. Yeah. I think, uh, Sorry, yeah, I'm speaking like a rock. <laughs> and finally, Pat, we want to know if we can come and peruse your wares. Do you have an online uh, presence? Where can we find you? I do. It's www.jpatricklewis.com. It's the website that I originally set up to try to facilitate school visits, and it's worked very well for that. Unfortunately, I'm a techie idiot. <laughs> <laughs> to find, <laughs> I can't think of a better word. And uh, I confess, I I haven't kept up with it as closely as I should. I try to keep up with the current books, but I, sometimes it doesn't get done as quickly as I'd like. You need to get a blog that you can there, handle all by yourself. It's much easier. <laughs> I hear the word blog and I think of quantum mechanics or something. No, something. no, no. It's, it's very intuitive. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> You're getting close to convincing me. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's the way to go. All right. <laughs> Anyways, Pat, thank you so much for stopping by today and for adding Mosquito to uh, No Water River's growing video uh, poetry library, which I really hope is going to just keep on growing. As you say, what was it, a, a thousand different blooms? What was your phrase? Let a hundred, let a hundred, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Let a hundred flowers bloom. I think Chairman Mao said that first. Okay, well, what he said... Let's hope that happens with the poetry videos. Let a hundred poetry videos bloom. Uh, not just by established poets like you, but also by unpublished poets uh, who right. just have really good poems to share. Sure. I really appreciate that you've been here uh, twice. Um, <laughs> technical difficulties. And, uh, and that you've taken the time to be a part of it. I can't tell you how much it's meant. Well, I hope I didn't sound too didactic. I, I sometimes get carried away when I professing about the virtues of poetry, so you'll have to forgive me. You're, you're forgiven. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Pat, and thanks to all, also to all of my readers who have been sticking with me through Poetry Month. And as Pat said, let's hope this is not an exclamation point, but just a comma to more and more poetry. We'll see you next time at No Water River. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.